Hi there and welcome to this uh, video about, uh, this is going to be uh, the introduction to the readings on nationalism that we have uh, for this final module uh, of the course. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk mostly about this Jerry Muller article that will read us and them. Uh, it talks about uh, ethno-nationalism in there, but there's also another reading there by Igor Torbakov, History, Memory and National Identity, Understanding the Politics of History and Memory Wars in Post-Soviet Lands. So uh, most of the uh, focus geographically, this module will be in, in, in Eastern Europe, but, but of course we're talking about nationalism and the rise of nationalism. And I want to start by sort of a, a brief introduction of my own that uh, nationalism, particularly since 2016 with the election of President Trump and, the election, uh, and also the, the, the referendum on Brexit, uh, in the English-speaking world, has really brought nationalism to its uh, to its to, to the forefront of our mind in terms of domestic national politics. I suppose Brexit has international implications too. Uh, well, as does, uh, of course, the election of, of President Trump in 2016 also has international implications. Uh, but nationalism, uh, sort of the, the, there's been a rise of nationalism in the world probably from before 2016 that perhaps wasn't as, as big a news in, 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 in the English speaking uh, world, right? So uh, we see the rise of right wing parties and, and civic groups in Germany, uh, alternative for, for, for Germany, or AFD, uh, alternative for Deutschland. Um, Pegida was big. Uh, there as well uh, and of course the the strength of the the of the well it was the the national front right the foreign national in france and and uh, they recently changed their name to uh, is it rally national now something a national rally something something like that in an attempt i think to break away from some of the uh the the less uh less acceptable um uh activities of, of that group in the 1970s and 80s and perhaps before. But, um, so we see in Europe a rise in nationalism, but not just in Europe, right? In another class in SGS 303, when I talk about, uh, it's called global trends, and I talk about sort of this rise of nationalism in the world. Uh, one of the other places I talk about is India and the rise of the BJP, the Hindu Nationalist Party there. I also, uh, in that class, by the way, uh, talk about the uh, the rise of uh, Islamism uh, as a movement across the uh, Islamic world, and uh, I try and compare that as well to, to, to nationalisms elsewhere, kind of in the context of like an anti-globalist, anti-globalization uh, sort of movements, I suppose. Right. So that's a different class, uh, but but I wanted to point out for this class that, that it, this is an important uh, an important concept, nationalism that ethno-nationalism in particular that is that is rising um, but it doesn't really start in 2016 but it's, it's 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 gaining some some popularity in terms of electoral politics but it's also gaining a lot of uh, a lot of uh, attention from the press and from from documentary makers and that sort of thing um, you know of course the Yugoslav wars in the 1990s was was a huge um, perhaps a, a harbinger, right, of the return of, of, of nationalism, a return to nationalism. Well, and that's really what Jerry Muller's getting at, right? So Jerry Muller starts here, he says, look, he says, the, the, the sort of narrative about Europe post-World War II is that after World War II, seeing the dangers of war, seeing the horrors of war, Europe, in order to prevent future wars, came together and started to pool sovereign. He says that's the narrative that you get. And the European Union is a, you know, the, the, the start right with the joining of France and Germany together in a steel and coal community that will mean that they can never fight each other in a war again, right? And that the history of Europe since World War II has been a history of integration, right? So where, where nationalisms have been sort of subdued by a supranational, right? An uh, above national, uh, regional bloc that, that uh, has been finding commonalities between people. And that's what's led to peace. And Jerry Muller says this is actually a very large misreading of European history in terms of nationalism since the Second World War. He says, in fact, nationalism, uh, the, 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 the sort of the success of the nation state since the Second World War has, has grown and has become complete fairly recently. 
And by complete, what he means is that what we've seen um, since the Second World War is, a, is, a, is, is actually more of a dissolution of multi-ethnic states into ethnic states. And so Yugoslavia right, is, 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 is a strong case. Yugoslavia uh, existed uh, before, uh, before the early 1990s. Right? Uh, 1992, I think, is, is probably a good date to have it uh, dissolved. Uh, but, but, but the early 90s was the, the, you know, a, a process, a dissolution of Yugoslavia. And what was Yugoslavia? Yugoslavia was one, one state, and it was multi-ethnic. It had Croats, and Serbs, and Slovenes, it had Macedonians, more, uh, Montenegrins, it had Bosniaks, all, all in there, right? Uh, and, and of course, other, other, other uh, nationalities too. It had uh, Albanians, a large minority of Albanians in, in Yugoslavia too. So that was a multi-ethnic state that had existed since, uh, since the Second World War, certainly, right? And it was also, it existed in a slightly different form uh, before the Second World War as well, uh, between the wars. So, um, you know, what happens, right? It dissolves itself with, with, with quite a lot of violence, uh, unfortunately, right? Uh, wars in Serbia, wars in Bosnia, right? Between Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, Bosnian Muslims, you know, wars in Croatia. You know, the, the disintegration was violent, right? And what did it disintegrate into? It dis disintegrated into, into ethnic, ethno-nationalist states. Disintegrated into Serbia, right? One state for the Serbs, right? Into Croatia, one nation for the Croats and the Slovenia, right? And so on and so forth, Macedonia, uh, Montenegro, right? So that did that. Where else did that happen? Right? That happened as well in um, Czechoslovakia, right? There used to be a country called Czechoslovakia, which had existed. Uh, certainly since the Second World War. Now there's two states there, right? Uh, even, even Czechoslovakia had to, had to break into two. So you've seen this all across, certainly Eastern and Central Europe, right? The break up of multi-ethnic states into single ethnic nation states. And Jerry Mullis says, actually, this is what's keeping the peace. It's peaceful in Europe because now every nation has its own state. And there's not, he says there are none. I think he says there are two. Uh, there are two uh, states in Europe where there's more than one nation uh, in that state. One of them is Belgium, which he says, you know, has, a, you know, I, I don't know if he says this very much, but, but I'll say it, right? Belgium uh, has, uh, you know, it's divided, right, into, into two, the, the French-speaking part, right, and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the Flemish-speaking uh, part. And oftentimes it's very difficult for them to form a government, right, because of the, the, the disagreements between these two nations right uh, and then i think uh, does he i don't know if he, if he says switzerland is the other one perhaps right where which is a, for a long time right being being a multi-ethnic confederation uh, and i'm not sure i don't know what he says about switzerland check that out if, if he even does mention it but you know he'll say oh there you go aside from switzerland in other words where the domestic ethnic balance of power is protected by strict citizenship laws and you have the separatist pro project has not so much vanished as triumphed that was a direct quote. I just saw Switzerland on the corner of my eye when I was talking about it. So, yeah. So, so the the, the separatist project has not so much vanished as triumphed. Uh, and so, you know, we talked about Yugoslavia. Of course, if we go back a little bit, a little bit before Yugoslavia, though, just a, a few a handful of years. Um, how many years? Maybe a handful. I'm not sure. But, um, the Soviet Union, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, right? The Soviet Union was a multi-ethnic, think of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, Belarus. Um, think of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, those Central Asian republics, right? Think of Armenia uh, and, and Azerbaijan, right? Um, Soviet, part of the Soviet Union, a multi-ethnic, multi-religious um, nation state, right? Super state, huge state. Um, but it dissolves, right? And it dissolves exactly along ethnic lines, right? And, uh, and this is what Jerry Muller said. He said, no, the, the history of Europe is not, since the Second World War is not a history of integration, it's a, it's a history of disintegration. And he says, peace is not due to the integration of states. He says it's due to the disintegration of states into single ethnic dominated states. You don't have to fight the war anymore, right? If you already have your own homeland, your own nation state, where it's just your nation, your nation is in, is in charge in that state and is, is predominantly, uh, uh, is predominant, I should say, just is predominant in that state, then 
then there's no more need to fight wars. Uh, I think is the is the assumption that Jerry Muller is is, is making. Um, and so, so that, that and there's a reason behind that. And I and I kind of want. I mean, I said I want you to read the reason in in Jerry Muller's words, but I I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about it in the video too to sort of whet your appetite. And this is it. He says, look. Um, the rise of nationalism, right? Nationalism comes about in Europe. And it comes about, you know, before nation states, you had these large empires, right? These large empires, think of the Russian Empire, certainly think of the Habsburg Empire, think of the Ottoman Empire, right? I think those are the three that he mentioned to you. So think of those, uh, those big empires, right? In sort of Central and Eastern Europe, multi-ethnic. Well, today we call them multi-ethnic. But at the time, right before nationalism, so um, you know, nationalism in the Ottoman Empire really doesn't come about until sort of the 1870s or something like that, right? And it sort of exists in the world before then, right? Absolutely, it exists in the world before then, but it's it's not a force. It's not. Remember my definition at the beginning of nationalism, right? That nationalism is the idea that the important an important division in the world. In, in nations, right? The, the, the world, the population of the world, right, is divided between different nations who speak different languages, who have different histories and cultures, and that that matters. So before 1878, that didn't matter in the Ottoman Empire. I'm saying 1878 because of the, the Treaty of uh, the San uh, uh, San Stefano Treaty and then the Treaty of Berlin, right, that, that really uh, establishes uh, Bulgaria as an independent state, but but we could maybe go a little bit before 1878, right? But 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 it's that sort of time that we're talking about where where ethnic divisions become a thing, right? Become even a significant element of life in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, before then, the the empire is not administered, right? By by nation, right? We don't have a group here that is okay. This group over here will have some representation because they're they're Bulgarians. This group of Greeks, and so we'll have some representation uh, from, from the Greek community. No, there's no Greek community or Bulgarian community, or Serbian community, or, you know, I might be overplaying this a little bit, but not that much, all right? Because the most important divisions are uh, religious ones, right? So this is the Orthodox Christian community, which includes, now we can look back and say, well, that includes Greeks and, 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 and uh, Bulgarians, right? And Serbians and, and Macedonians as well, we can say that. Um, as well as, as, as well as others, no doubt. But um, <clears throat> but at the time, that's, that that wasn't really the distinctions that people were making, and that didn't really have any significance in in political life. It was religious distinctions did, right? And so that you see that the Greeks and the Bulgarians uh, and and the Serbs, for that matter, right, before they get their own uh, state, are represented by the Church, right, by the Orthodox Church, by the Patriarch. Of Constantinople, uh, who is responsible and has a lot of political power uh, as the representative of Christians in the Ottoman Empire, right, in, in European Turkey. So um, um, that's the distinction that's important, not ethnic distinctions. And what be, uh, and, and, and Muller talks us through uh, where does ethno nationalism come from? What, where does it arise from? And the answer is that. Um, is that people of different socioeconomic backgrounds who spoke sometimes different languages, who were educated slightly differently in the Ottoman Empire, started to, to notice these differences, right? These socioeconomic differences and the, the privileges that came with certain types of education and realized that people like them, that that themselves and people like them, their neighbors, people who were educated in the same way as them, who, who performed the same sort of economic role as them. And by the way, because of the education spoke different languages, uh, were disadvantaged within the empire. And they said, well, we're, we're, we're disadvantaged and we're going to be disadvantaged unless we can somehow break away and form our own political community where our people, right? Our people of our socioeconomic class perhaps, right, of our role in society 
can set laws that privilege us or that, that, that benefit us in some ways, right? And so in the Ottoman Empire, right, this is the story of the, the, the Bulgarians, like the Slavs, where, um, so, so I said, right, that the Christians in the Ottoman Empire, so, so think of the, um, think of uh, the Balkans, right, uh, Christians, uh, and there's Christians elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire, but, but this is really the focus of the story of, of nationalism, right, is the Balkans. So um, Christians in that, in that part, they're, they're represented by, again, the, the Orthodox Church and by the head of the Orthodox Church, by the, well, one of the important heads of the Orthodox Church, by the Patriarch of Constantinople. Right, who, who, who is uh, uh, a man uh, who is, um, has the ear of the Sultan, right? And, and, and yes, the Christian community in the Ottoman Empire has some disadvantages. Um, for example, one of the, like, they're, they're with, they can't uh, give testimony against a, a Muslim in a court, for example, uh, before 1878, they can't. Um, uh, and, and so, well, the, you know, they can't raise the prominent positions in the government, but, but this patriarch is prominent, right? This patriarch is prominent and uh, is a, has the ear of the Sultan and has power and influence over the Christians um, in the Ottoman Empire and, and can, can get things done, right? Now, the thing with the, the Orthodox Church and the, and the Patriarch of Constantinople is that the patriarch and the senior clerics, right, the senior bishops and archbishops, in the Ottoman Empire are Greek speaking, right? They go, the, 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 the seminary that they go to, you know, they, they learn Greek. Greek is the language of God, uh, certainly in the Ottoman Empire, but, but going back to the Byzantine times as well. Right? And think of the New Testament, right, it's written in Greek. So, so there's some advantage there of speaking Greek and of having that education that allows you to speak Greek. And so all the people who are, you know, the, the urban elites, the, the, the so, so, so first of all, the church, but then on top of that, the you know, the, the um, well, the Greeks get a lot of, uh, you know, through the relationship between the patriarch and the sultan, the uh, Greek speakers, uh, and I said Greeks, and I didn't, I don't mean to do that yet because we're not quite there, but Greek speaking people uh, and, and Christians generally, but the upper echelons, which are educated uh, in, in a certain way and speak Greek and, and live in cities uh, and they're either upper level clergy or they're, or they're um, merchants and uh, other sort of uh, middle class uh, bourgeois, I suppose, um, uh, bourgeois because they live in cities, right? City dwelling urban elites speak Greek. And they dominate the markets and they dominate the markets where the more rural population uh, who are not speaking Greek, right? They're speaking Slavic dialects, right? Uh, what, what later becomes Macedonian or Bulgarian or Serbian, right? And there's sort of a continuum uh, in, in that uh, language, right? From sort of Bulgarian in the east, you know, around Macedonian and in the north into Serbia, the sort of gr a gradation there of, of the language. But anyway, um, uh, the point is that they're, so, so they're, they're speaking a different language. They're going to church, which is oftentimes in Greek, uh, and because that's the language of God and the language of the church and the language of the senior clergy, uh, though, though not of all the clergy, right? The, the lower echelons of the clergy are speaking Slavic languages, are speaking uh, Slavic languages. And so, um, when you're going to church, perhaps, uh, maybe, maybe your local parish priest, maybe he is speaking the language that you're speaking. So maybe you do understand what's going on in church. And, and some of the churches will have, did have uh, you know, one service in Greek, one service in Bulgarian, or, or in, in a Slavic language, right? Um, the, 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 the people could understand. Um, and the villages, though, of course, think of the, you know, so we've talked about cities a little bit. Villages, you know, you would have a mixture, right? The people who've been educated in Greek schools and people who hadn't been educated in Greek schools, uh, who'd maybe been educated later on, I guess, after 1870 in Bulgarian schools, but um, anyway. But some people maybe perhaps didn't speak Greek and some people did, is, is, is my point. And so then, uh, Muller doesn't go into this detail, but, but, he, but, but this is an example of what he's saying. What he's saying is that, that there's, a, there's a group of people within one of these empires that sees their, their uh, progress and their development, their economic privileges sort of stunted. Uh, and this would, would be the case of the Slavic people who are generally not living in 
generally speaking, there's a majority of them not living in towns, uh, living in the countryside, doing more agricultural uh, work and, and having small amounts of land perhaps to work on. Um, all of the big landowners were, were Turks, but, but uh, then you had the, the sort of urban Greek elite, Greek speaking elite in the, in the cities. And then you had the, the, the more um, uh, people living in the countryside, right? Working in agricultural, and there's a lot of those people. And when they take their products to market, they're, they're going into the towns, into the cities, to the markets that are dominated by Greek speakers. And their church is dominated also by Greek speakers, even if their local parish priest might be a Slav uh, or might be speaking Slavic languages, the, you know, the, his boss is speaking Greek, right? And so then, People notice that and they say no the Bulgarians uh, who the, those who are about to become Bulgarians I suppose um, you know and I'm not trying to discount a Bulgarian past which of course exists uh, in medieval times right? but those who are about to, 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 to inhabit this new uh, in 1878 this new principality of Bulgaria um, before then right in the 1860s and 50s start to advocate for uh, a separate church give us our own uh, church because this one's dominated by Greek speakers and we can't speak Greek right? and that's city urban Greek speakers and, and we haven't been educated in that way and we, we don't identify uh, with those people and we we can't progress and we can't have our own our own people our own priests perhaps are not you know rising up the, the hierarchy right? and, they're, and they're different from you guys right in some ways right and so you know there's different reasons why that might be the case it's sort of encouraged in some ways by by well, I was going to say by outside, uh, yeah, by outside uh, powers, right, into the region. You know, Western Europe at this time already has very much uh, sort of an, an established national uh, national system. Uh, probably Western Europe, you, you know, you can start from the, the, the French Revolution or something like that, uh, but, but maybe even a little bit before then in terms of uh, nation building. Um, but it hasn't stretched yet into, into Central and Eastern Europe in the same way. Anyway, um, but now it is uh, in our story. And so, uh, yeah, so, so what happens is eventually like the, 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 the successful in that the, the, a Bulgarian church splits away, mostly away from the patriarchate, right? And becomes sort of a second uh, Christian group within the empire. And that second Christian group now is the Bulgarians, right? And so you've got Bulgarians. And as soon as you get Bulgarians, now you have Greeks. And that's again a little bit of a simplification because Greek, there was a Greek state, a small Greek state in 18, uh, that, that started fighting the war of independence in 1821. I think 1830 is when it gets recognized a small independent Greek state. But so this is a, a slight simplification, but this is this is this is Muller's sort of story. This is why uh, nation states come about because there's groups of people within an existing society that feel united in their being left out of power. Right? And so what happens is they get their own country and now they can do whatever they want. They can make the laws they want. They have their own markets, right? They have their own uh, schools. They have their own churches. Uh, and that's what they want. And so, and, th and then that, that just stretches out. The, and then that just really explains Muller's argument that now that everybody in Europe, every, uh, you know, at least to this point, everybody uh, has their own nation state, right? Sets their own government, their own laws. That's what leads to peace. Not the pooling of sovereignty, right? But the, but the, the, disintegration of sovereignty right and so uh, have a look at that see what you i mean i've probably given you quite a lot of it there actually but there's still uh there's still there's still uh plenty there to 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 look at um and of course me saying it out loud sort of extemporaneously is uh is is not as organized, not as methodical, right, as the, as the Muller reading, thankfully, right? This, otherwise it wouldn't be worth reading. So um, definitely have a look at that. Um, I, I will just introduce before I go this, this last, uh, last paper of the semester, really, Ingo Torbakov. Uh, this is more about Eastern Europe and it's particularly about the, the, the disintegration of the Soviet Union and what sort of uh, mechanisms or what sort of what sort of politics, what sort of rhetoric, what sort of narrative really um, is required in the building of national identity? Right? And so, you know, it's sort of the next step, if you like, right? So now you've got these, 
you've got this group of people who are feeling disenfranchised in a particular uh, society. And so they, they see differences between them and the dominant uh, people. And they realize they're never going to rise to, to positions of influence in order to make their lives better. And so they split from, from that group. OK, now that they've split, now what? Right? How, do we, how do we make ourselves into Bulgarians now? Or, or how do we make ourselves into Greeks now or Macedonians? Right? What is it that it takes? Right? And, and, and you'll see in, it takes uh, a lot of uh, interpretations of history, right, is one of the big things that it takes. When I, when I initially at the beginning, and I'll sort of end here where I began, I, I hope I began here, I certainly meant to, but I've said at least once more in the middle, right? So if it's not the beginning, it's the middle that I'm about to repeat. This definition of, of, of nations. There are groups, the world, the population of the world is divided into groups. These groups are sort of united by a language, in the case of the Bulgarians, right, a Slavic language, right, as opposed to a Greek language. Uh, a language, uh, a history, right, which of course Bulgaria also had, which I alluded to, right, the, the, the sort of medieval Bulgarian uh, state that, that fought with the Byzantine Empire and then eventually was absorbed into, into Byzantium, into the Byzantine Empire. Um, so so, so that's, that's, a, that's a history too, uh, that they have, so they share it. You know, a language, a history, a, a, and broadly a culture, right? So food and customs and, um, you know, uh, religions as well, maybe, right? And maybe the religious practices are, uh, of, of Slavic Orthodox Christians are different from those of the Greeks, uh, although they shouldn't be too different, probably, right? Anyway, um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, and, and since that's, that's the definition of nationalism, right? This idea that th th those differences and those Groups are, are significant in international affairs, right? That they mean something. Um, then, uh, then, 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 of course, uh, of course, you, you wouldn't be surprised to find, right? That, that in terms of nation building and building a building nationalism, history is an important uh, place to do that, right? As I imagine is language, right? Well, not I imagine as is language. Uh, and those other things that I mentioned. So uh, I think you'll hear most, mostly about uh, history and, and particularly the history of the, and the interpretation of the, of the world wars uh, by these, um, you know, and, and it has, I'll just uh, leave you with a, sort of a, a tease to, to, to try and encourage you into this reading. And it's, uh, it says this, uh, there's no question that Russia is seriously affected by this new historiographic situation stemming from the confluence of the post-imperial controversies and the history debates born of the recent geopolitical changes in Europe. It should not then come as a surprise that Moscow responds, sometimes very harshly to what it perceives as a challenge to its national interests. The latter are believed to be particularly gravely threatened by the hostile interpretations of World War II, or what is better known in Russia as the Great Patriotic War. So my key point here is that similar to its Eastern European neighbors, Moscow's conduct too can only be properly understood within the context of Russian identity politics. Well, I'll leave it there because I'm almost going to read the whole thing to you now. Um, good, right? The idea that um, the idea that there can be a hostile interpretation of history. Right. So that's 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 covered well in that reading, and and and, and since I've given a lot of mother to you, I'll leave. Uh, uh, Talbukov uh, entirely to you, almost entirely to you.